the Egyptian people, they believe if you share somebody a meal, um, you're destined to see that person again, no matter how far you separate. There's just something, yeah, you don't really, I feel like, need a lot of language or communication to like express, you know, to taste something, like, know that it's good and it tastes good. I think American, it's not specific kinds of food, but specific dynamics around food. But not because you need them, because I want it to. Nobody asked me to cook, but I want it to, because it's my family. Not because I'm Italian, but the Italian food is the best. It's very the original Italian food. Over here, even if you go to the restaurant, the Italian food, it's not like that. It's not the same. Maybe you cook a little bit the same way, but it's different. We, we, we put a time when we cook. We, we stay, no rush, 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 you know, uh, because you gotta cook, you gotta go somewhere. We used, to, we used to do everything, almost everything I make, you know. My the food I make myself, is better than outside. At first uh, I offer a nice antipasto, with antipasto, with uh, salami, artichoke, eggplant, uh, coconuts, but very nice fixes, anchovy. And then came Wearing soap, but not wearing like here. And then we have a uh, gnocchi di badan, or maybe um, a stuffed shelf, or make. And then we have meat, the, the sauce, you know, meatball. Uh, and then we have a roast, roasted chicken, potato. the fruit and then espresso and then a cookie so it was different it's sort of strange because i consider like the u.s my home like pretty much sort of an identity crisis for a while, you're like, am I Peruvian, am I American? But I feel pretty strongly like American in a lot of ways. Um, and also Peruvian, I mean, I think it's like any immigrants that try to sort of preserve their traditions. But it does sort of remind me of like Peru for sure. And, and it's definitely 
the way that I'm most connected to my uh, ancestry. It's definitely because it's like I'm doing it every day. I don't make all this food every day because it's so elaborate. Um, it takes a lot of time, but there are certain like dishes that I make that are more simplified versions of it. Um, but it's yeah, it's a totally connection. Um, my name is Diop Mohamedou. It's a long name. It's a ver another version of Mohamed. But nobody ever calls me that name. They just go for Diop or for my nickname, you. Which is a funny for American people to hear. I'm from Mauritania, a country that is in West Africa. We share the same border with Senegal and Morocco. I mean, it's a bit scary because people are very poor and I run a school like the English language center in West Africa, Mauritania country. I love it. I like teaching and I love school administration. This is our, on our way to Mojimu, right? Mm-hmm. Oh. I like cooking. There's not much else to do when you're staying at home watching a small child. So cooking entertains her usually, and um, then I know I'm getting good food, then I know where it was prepared. We find for opportunity, we find for excuse, you know, to do the German and the Persian cooking. And sometimes it's a little bit different as well. It's a little bit rivalry between us two. A little bit of competition is very helpful, but usually I lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In every marriage, when people coming from a two different culture, there are some similarity and there are some differences. You know, you know, even if two people, you know, these days get married, coming from the same culture, same town, you know, they have some challenges when they get married. And I think that challenge is probably much more when people coming totally from two different cultures. You know, there was a lot of misinformation, there a lot of misperception about Iran, Iranian culture. So there are good, there are bad and ugly things when two people get married, you know, from totally different culture and two different religions. Has pluses and minuses. The movie, you know, named Without My Daughter that portrayed the Iranian men and Iranian custom and a culture in a very, very negative way. And obviously, I uh, wasn't able to, you know, tell Christine that really is not exactly the same about the Iranian culture, or at least it's not with my family. When she had a chance to go and see it firsthand, and I think that was wonderful for her and was wonderful for Susie. Possibly, you know, the, the misinterpretations, the miscues and all of that that happens, you, you can figure it out. You can at least talk about it, okay? And you can understand, oh, th that's why it is. It's not meant um, as a jab or, you know, uh, it's not intentional. Also get a lot of benefits, you know. I think, you know, daughter probably is the main beneficiary of, you know, two different cultures. And I think for me, I get a little bit of sense of appreciation, if not for German food, but obviously for German culture. There are different kinds of Italian food here. I mean, there is uh, Italian food just like we eat also in Italy, exactly the same. But then there is Italian-American food, which is completely different. So at first I, I had no exposure to Italian-American food, so when I first came here I was a little confused, I couldn't recognize the dishes. Um, it, was, it was interesting for me to discover another tradition that had developed 
f from common elements with Italian food, but it's, it's become something different. It's For instance, how come here you have sp spaghetti with meatballs? In Italy, we don't have that dish. So it's similar to spaghetti, it's similar to meatballs. How come here it became something else? How, do you, how come here there is chicken parmi parmesan? We don't have that. Oh, whatever I did in Italy, I bring here. But then I got to work too. I got to work in the restaurant that was in Italy too. And still with the food, like we used to be, we call it the food of the paese, the old fashioned way. Back in the day, my grandfather had a bread shop and he also had a, you know, he had little like little deli he had, you know, so he had cold cuts. So at night, you know, the bakers would be hungry, so he's like, how can I feed the bakers? So he used to take a little of the old bread dough. And used to stick the uh, the cold cuts inside the dough. He kind of we thought you know invented the calzone because no one had ever heard of it. La cascia, when I, I started 25 years ago, la cascia non me, me lasagna, I came lasagna for some barriers froze. And then I say, Anthony, I know how to make lasagna, we don't want this lasagna, I said, I don't like. You sure, Angie? And we, we, you say, we get lasagna for 20 years. No, no, I started making lasagna. I bring lasagna over there because otherwise it don't make. I make me ball, I make cutlet, I make stuff with pepper, I make uh, chicken and broccoli, ziti, all the kind of things you need to do. I know you would. She works hard. She stands there, never gets to sit. Picks up heavy stuff. God bless her. God bless her. I like work now. Um, it, it bothers me because I'm a little bit old. I don't feel like get up in the morning. But I like the people, you know what I mean? I like everybody. I'm not fighting nobody for 25 years. Ah. All right, oh. over there. Ah. Walk me in the walk good. You stay there. Uh, I work there. He loves me like a family. I love him too. I love him. He loves me too. I tell you. Okay. <laughs> we love you. She, she's like a, you know, family. family. That's oh. family. And father, she's like our great 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 grandmother. <laughs> 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 I was probably too young to miss a lot of it. I think mm -hmm. um, probably. Some of the foods that you can't really get here, and when we came to, there wasn't really, like I said, a lot of Hispanic people, so we didn't have like markets where we could get ingredients. Like now, we, my mom could get like these peppers that, you know, we never were able to really cut. We would like salivate and be like, oh, I wish we could get this food, but there wasn't enough Hispanic population for them to import and stuff. So for a while, we just kind of, um, you know, adapted in a way, I guess, to American food. But I love American food, especially like, like, I don't know, real, like real, like old school American food, like casseroles and I don't know, things like that I really think are cool and like meatloaf, I don't know, things that are probably like really boring to people and like, oh, meatloaf, I'm like, this is so neat. <laughs> Just because I don't know how to like, you know, make it, mm. so for me it's like, oh wow, yeah. this is exotic. I mean, I hate eating by myself. Um, I think it's more fun to eat with people and to share food with people um, and to cook for people. I mean, it's one of the reasons why 
I want to start this food stand is really so that I can cook for people. So my job right now, I work for an environmental nonprofit, um, and it's a great job. It pays the bills. Um, I love like the mission behind it, but for me, it's like at this point, I'm sort of looking now at transitioning into doing more hands-on things. I mean, I think anytime when you work with a big organization, you sometimes feel disconnected from like the field, what's happening, like like having that one-on-one -on -one connection with the people. So I really want to um, do something with food that's really local and where I get to meet people, interact with people, and um, introduce them to my culture through food. We're starting with the farmer's market. Um, it's like an experiment really for us in a way. Um, it's kind of scary, I mean, to put your food out there, and it's not just your food, it's like all this, like, a lot of pressure um, to put out, like, something really good that's going to represent, like, your, you know, your culture, because, you know, if people have really bad Peruvian food for their first experience, they're not going to want to go to another Peruvian place, you know, so first impressions are really important, and so we feel like the most big sense of um, responsibility to do a really good job. There's just all this history um, that I, a lot of people don't know about and I'd love to share that with people. And so food is really the way to do it for me and also it's a way for me to connect with the local community here, like to be, to be able to introduce them to my world and be a part of the community in that way, just sort of to make our local community richer. Once you get into the market, there's also, um, you need to have a fair um, stand license so that you can, if you're gonna prepare some food at the market, you need a separate like um, license and then have to register as an LLC. So I have all that paperwork as well. There's a lot of different parts to it, more than I probably imagined <laughs> when I started. I think I was a little naive in some ways, but there's a lot of, yeah, paperwork and things that mm. have to be done. One of the things I think is really going to make it special is that we are growing a lot of our peppers that are going to Peruvian food, um, which I don't know too many people are doing right now. And it, they're not the kind of peppers that are really hot. Like they're the kind of peppers that add flavor. Like this pepper in particular, ajipanca, has been said to taste like notes of blueberry and different things. So it's it's not what you think normally of peppers where you're like, oh my god, I can't eat this. This is like way too spicy. It's like these peppers really add flavor. I'm meeting all these people that are like, we want to do this, or I'm growing this rare potato from Peru. And it's just, it's really awesome um, to sort of have that and to feel like um, there's something like magical happening. So it's really cool. Is at times is adapted so uh, of course you know when food travels it changes it cannot be exactly the same otherwise it becomes sort of a a museum piece you know food is alive it changes it, it evolves and when it moves of course it evolves <laughs> um, we're making this dish called ají con gallina which is um it's like a chicken with peppers, I guess would be the translation. So it's um, shredded chicken that we like boiled all morning and then um, create like a sauce for it um, with this um, pepper, which is from Peru, that my mom brought up from Connecticut. Um, but it's basically like, kind of like, um, I wouldn't say like a stew, but more creamy, like a creamy chicken with, in this yellow sauce and we'll serve it with rice and potatoes. This is a causa, which is, wow. um, it's filled with a um, tuna and um, onions and a few other things. So inside there, there are there is food. And um, it's like, um, it's a, like a mashed potato cake that you mash the potatoes and then you make it into this like um, kind of dough, I guess. You rework it into a dough and then you build the first layer and then you fill it in and then you fill it over and it's got little specks of that yellow um, 
the ahi amarillo, which is bell pepper, which is kind of like the foundation for Peruvian food. It's in a lot of dishes, so you'll find it in like, it's got little specks in there that sort of just add it, give it flavor. We are making the beef heart kebabs. Ooh. They're in here. And they've been marinating since last night. Um, and they are um, marinated with a cumin um, vinegar um, and a red panka pepper, which is another Peruvian pepper that my mom brought up, um, and a little bit of garlic. Um, and so we just left that overnight. And then we're going to make it actually on the panini grill because we have to adapt to cooking in my <laughs> tiny kitchen. But um, I've already cooked them before on the panini grill and it actually comes out really well. Okay. It just it cooks really quickly. I mean, you only have to cook it for like a few minutes. Um, the meat is so tender, it's almost like veal. Oh, um, wow. Most people think it's like really tough meat, but it's actually like very soft. And then we made um, chicha, which is the Peruvian purple national drink after Inca Cola, I would say this is like. <laughs> um, and we made this with purple corn, which I can show you. Um, we boiled this last night for a few hours with um, cloves, cinnamon, pineapple rind. Um, we didn't use apples this time. If we were going to make the pudding, we would have used apples or quince, but we didn't because um, we're not making the pudding. We already have too many dishes going on today. There is something about food that connects people together. Number one person who calls the shots is my customer. The customer comes and asks for a certain item. I don't have it on stock. And um, I have lots of items here where I um, brought in at one person's request and end up becoming as good sellers. Um, certain items I get and don't sell. So now I end up using that. So they're called yummy, and they are. So it's not just a name, they really are yummy. Um, I wouldn't want to start eating them because I, I will never know when to stop. Yeah. I, I eat those like you eat a piece of cheese. What kind of testicles are yeah, they? Goat. Goat testicles, yeah. Oddly, sometimes when I say, when people ask where you're from, I say, I'm from Palestine, and I say, oh, yeah, you're from Israel. I say, no, I'm not from Israel. I'm Palestinian. Yeah, but isn't that Israel? I say, no, it's not. And it turns into a heated discussion about politics and uh, will end up being somehow bitter. And I decide to politely get out of it and without having to invoke any talking about history and culture and why and how and what to explain this and explain that. Because a lot of people, they don't, you know, if you haven't met people from Palestine, how would you know about Palestinians? 
I was told back in the 80s that um, people were surprised to see me driving cars because they thought that we only ride camels. College students, graduate students asked me that question. So you have cars back in the Middle East? I said, no. What kind of cars? I said, you name it, we have it. What is it, Cadillac? 442. Uh, I remember this guy said, what is, what's a 442? I said, ah, here you go. It's an American car that you don't know about, and I had drove back at home. The minute they look at my passport and saw the word Palestine on it, you know, to my U.S. passport saying born in Palestine, um, I was a suspect. They said, automatically. And, um, they said, we need to take your car to a special place to have it checked out. Looking for bombs, drugs, explosives, whatever they were looking for. Uh, they held me for three hours. The excuse was that they were waiting for a permission or for an okay from Washington to be, to be allowed to let after three hours when I left, uh, the guy in charge there, he said, we'll see you next time. I said, you know what? You're never going to see me on this border again. As a matter of fact, you guys made sure I would never, ever in my life cross this border again. And I had it. I don't want to handle the hassle of being treated like a criminal. The minute they look at the color of my skin. But if you're not interested, who's going to teach you that? Of course, there's always the, the two sources or the two, the two poles of any conversation. There's the receiving and there's the sending. And if I'm the sending, uh, if you're not receiving, if you're not receptive enough, um, you can just hear it from one ear and get it out of it. But if you really ask a question because you're interested and you want to know, you will retain a lot of conversation. Food is, you know, something we live with, you know. You have to eat. <laughs> you have to be able to make it, which unfortunately I can't. <laughs> yeah, in my culture, men don't cook. We don't cook. That's why I don't cook. And mm. that's why I don't know how to cook. <laughs> but she does. When I travel, I like to learn how to cook the food in the places I go. Um, and also, um, yeah, cooking for him his food is something that, uh, you know, it's, it's nice for him to, to be able to have that without going to find someone else to cook for him. As well as over there, with the ingredients you find, there's not much else you can cook easily. <laughs> So there's kind of those three reasons for learning how to cook Mauritanian food. There were and there are still not many options. Yeah, we have very limited options. Even though when you go to the market, you can find all these different sort of things. Still, people have very limited options. And whatever meal I name that I say from my country, Indeed, it's not just from there. You could find, you can find the same stuff in all over West Africa. The meals are usually big. Jobujan, which is originally from Senegal, and that is rice and fish. Some people have couscous. There we all eat with hands. Well, actually Claire likes eating with hands. Up to now, she likes it. Sometimes even here, we just go for hands. Even if I do cook other types of food, we often eat like uh, still around a big serving bowl, um, all of us together, because I think that's a really nice style of eating, um, instead of everyone having their separate things on their separate plates. When I was little, my favorite food was, and still is, mafe. Mafe is the peanut butter sauce. Rice. Some people go for fish in it or meat in it. I'm making mafe, and you can find mafe in 
all the countries of West Africa. I think all their meals take a while if you're to make it um, correctly and because they always make such big meals, it takes a long time. Um, you might say if you're in a rush, maybe an hour. And uh, if you're making chevajin, the lunch meal, that's the main meal. Um, two hours, three hours, and they that's what they used to make for lunch every day. So they spend a lot of time cooking. For me, and I think same thing for Christina, and this is what we're trying to teach Susie. I don't look at cooking as a show. I look at it as a recreation. It's fun. It's very relaxing for me. Very relaxing. And especially with it's your mind off of it. And it's, if it's a Persian food, you know, I can, I, I can reconnect to my culture as I cook, you know. I think of my mom, you know, how she did it, you know, how, what she was doing in the kitchen. I think it's, 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 it's a good way for me to connect to my family and connect I really enjoy it. German food, you know, food that, <laughs> that I like, yes. But again, you know, it's the food that that we cook uh, because it's familiar. It's just something that you take with you and it's because it's part of you. You know, there are always there is always an element of nostalgia. There are memories. There is a past, but I think it's in in dialogue with the present. And you know, it can have different outcomes. You can decide to stick to the past. You can decide to go towards the future. You can decide to go towards various forms of fusion. Mondays were the days that we did laundry. Oh, yeah, it was a whole process and took several people and took the whole day. And on those days, we got a special soup. So that was what we call laundry soup. <laughs> and when I came to US, because the knee is a mother of invention, and you know, you. How do you learn to cook when you're hungry and when you sometimes really don't like American food, which was difficult for me at the beginning, get used to it. So I tried to make some Persian dish. So I called my mom and I got the same recipe, believe it or not, of the food that I hated. She didn't know she should laugh or should cry. Of course, in, there's now a German word, dressing. Okay, it's not a German word, of course. But. <laughs> We have uh, adopted it, okay? Um, broccoli, you know, it was not something that we ate, or corn. Oh, that was another funny one. So I, I had some corn in the US, and well, corn on the cob. I had never seen it before, and so somebody asked me, would you like some corn? And I said, well, actually, in Germany, only the pigs eat corn. And 
there has to be some humility, you know, and it, it's fine, you know, you have to, as Reza said earlier, you have to be able to make fun of yourself. I think it's for a daughter or for any person, it's important to know a bit about other culture, other religion, and other food. At least, even if we don't like the food and culture, we develop a better sense of appreciation we have for our own good, for our own food and culture. For example, if someone says, oh, Persian food is bad, you know, compared to America, we have some ways to make it comparison. So, tomorrow is the first day of a spring. Is a new beginning, and a Persian New Year in Farsi called No Ruz, New Day, New Beginning, and the, that's the essence of a Persian New Year. And uh, this is something I have been doing since I left Iran in honor of my mom and dad, especially my mom, because my mom says, "Whatever you do, I don't want you to forget the good part of your culture." And I think that is really important for a lot of people like me and my wife. A lot of people come to this country, you know, from a different culture and a different religion or different custom. I try to connect them, Iranian to American, American with us, you know. I try to make like a community between Iranian and American together. to do we have to have this table or they call it surfeit or the uh, or the knees and we have to have at least seven different things that is start with s obviously s in persian so i have sirke i have somag i have sib i have seke i have sombod i have siadune i have senjet and i have sir one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I hope my mom and dad are happy. Tonight is a special night, and I think is customary for almost every Iranian household to have rice with some green vegetables mixed with the rice. Remember the, the way I fixed my rice, there was nothing in it. So as they put the rice back in the pot, they put a layer of green stuff, such as dill and other green stuff. And that's, I think, it's an important part of tradition. And be honest with you, a day like this, you know, is the difficult time for me because I have been in this country since 1977. This is my home, but also Iran is my home. So I'm pulled and pushed between those two cultures, between those two countries. And I hope I don't have to be forced to make a choice to choose one over the other one. We're starting with the farmer's market. Um, it's like an experiment really for us in a way. Um, it's kind of scary, I mean, to put your food out there. And it's not just your food, it's like all this like, a lot of pressure um, to put out like something really good that's gonna represent like your, you know, your culture because you know, if people have a really bad Peruvian food for their first experience, they're not going to want to go to another Peruvian place, you know, so first impressions are really important, and so we feel like the most big sense of um, responsibility to do a really good job. There's just all this history um, that I, a lot of people don't know about, and I'd love to share that with people, and so food is really the way to do it for me, and also it's a way for me to connect with the local community here, like to be, to be able to introduce them to my world and be a part of the community in that way, just sort of to make our local community richer. Once you get into the market, there's also, um, you need to have a fair um, stand license so that you can, if you're going to prepare some food at the market, you need a separate like um, license and then have to register 
as an LLC, so I have all that paperwork as well. There's a lot of different parts to it, more than I probably imagined <laughs> when I started. I think I was a little naive in some ways, but there's a lot of, yeah, paperwork and things that mm. have to be done. One of the things I think is really going to make it special is that we are growing a lot of our peppers that are going to Peruvian food, um, which I don't know too many people are doing right now. And it, they're not the kind of peppers that are really hot. Like, they're the kind of peppers that add flavor. Like, this pepper in particular, ajipanca, has been said to taste like notes of blueberry and different things. So it's it's not what you think normally of peppers where you're like, oh my god, I can't eat this. This is like way too spicy. It's like these peppers really add flavor more than just, you know, I'm meeting all these people that are like, we want to do this, or I'm growing this rare potato from Peru. And it's just, it's really awesome um, to sort of have that and to feel like um, there's something like magical happening. So it's really cool. I enjoy cooking for people. Um, for myself as well, but I really enjoy cooking for people. Um, I think there's something really like intimate about preparing something for someone or for a group of people. Um, you're putting like all your love into it, I feel like, and all your like, and it takes a while. I mean, it takes time to prepare something that, I, that is good, I think, and that people are gonna like, and um, you're doing it with your hands. I mean, it's just so, so like intimate They have to do it until they throw up. When they throw up again, the dad or whoever is taking care of that is not going to stop. So, okay, you just throw up. You have, you need more. Traditionally, men, men in general, love, I mean, they, they don't like, they don't even like skinny women. In my country, that most men, when they see a woman, they, they look behind the woman <laughs> and say, oh, the back is nice, <laughs> you know, they, they go for that first. And that is something they think is healthy looking and wealthy looking. I feel very differently. I have a, a, a two sisters in Italy and my mother, because my, ma, uh, my father came in this country in America to make money. To let us stay the family bare, you know, to build a beautiful house, you build so many things. But the problem was when my father finished the house, it was a beautiful house, the war came. My father didn't have a chance to see the house because the war came, the new house was destroyed. When we see that the Germany came over here, everybody tried to save something. And then my grandpa had a lot of oil. He said, maybe he will find. But the trouble was the Germany had a machine. And then he told my grandpa, "Si you don't give me the oil, I'm going to kill you. Was a trip behind her. If yeah, if for the Germany like the like the the tie the feel the tie the everything. And then the Gamel, my aunt, he said, please, pa, tell her what's the oil is because I'm gonna kill you. And my grandpa said, I don't mind, but I don't give us the sweet the the tell her what's the oil is. Then one day was a beautiful, beautiful day over there was March. Every, every tree there pitch. Every, every tree March started poor flower, you know, it was beautiful. I would sit around and run and drag me, me, my sister. And I put a sweat over there. I said, the day is beautiful. It's gonna stay nice outside. No, no, no noise. Nothing. 
ऐसे जगह में जगह में वो घर को इंसाइड इधर बम काम इसे आर यू नो ऐसे दिस थिंग इसे आई वे आई वे समथिंग रिवर्स वो गेट वो गो इंसाइड इधर बम केम ओवर दे एंड द स्वेर वाज स्ट्रोय एस वी स्टे ओवर दे ना जा ले ले बे वो एवरीबॉडी डाइ वाज एप्रिल क्वेंड द द इंग्लिश केम सेव आस It was April, April seven, and then we come back uh, 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 the village or so. You know, when we see the house, everything uh, red, red, a lot of red because a lot of dead people over there. Yeah. I still am alive. I still am okay. I have my kids, my grandchildren. I'm happy. Each uh, ethnicity has dealt with the new situation in different ways. So there is not just one historical development for every uh, for every community. They reacted to different situations. They reacted to different levels of racism. Uh, they had access to different jobs. So I mean, it's different to generalize, but in general. You can say that you know they had to adapt to the new situation in terms of ingredients, uh, possibilities, perception from the the community, and their engagement with food business. When I hear those three words simultaneously, immigration, food, and culture. I know as a professor of economics, immigration brings some social and economic hardship for some American. But at the same time, the immigrant the, with their food and their culture make this country so powerful, make this country so powerful, make this country so different. So and, interesting. And so interesting. Yes. And honestly, God, we should be grateful with all the goods. Yes, they bring some bad, both of us included, but also the immigrant bring a lot of food and put it in economic terms, the benefit of the immigrant with their rich culture and food by far surpass the cost and the pain and suffering they might bring us. It brings back, you know, that social sitting around the big bowl, having this traditional meal, chatting with each other telling stories. It's it's nice, it's really nice. Mm -hmm. I like that, yeah. America cook, I like it uh, I like pa you know, it don't matter what you uh, turn, it's not the same. It's funny because like in the US I feel like there's still a lot of tension a lot around different ethnic groups and things, but like even I would say people that maybe don't like a certain ethnic group still love ethnic food. I mean, I don't believe in the concept of authenticity per se. Um, I think it's you know, as I said, food changes, and uh, if we try just to stick to traditions, we risk to kill the development of food. But the the sad part of it is that. Most people, like most immigrants, they would not go for unknown things. My advice for everyone is like, wherever you are, just try to get to be get used to whatever you, people are used to or people are not. See you.